Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody in today and uh, another uh, opportunity to share the Word. And uh, we trust that as we teach, you're praying and asking that the Spirit will direct us. For those of you out in television, again, we just want to welcome you to an informal Bible study. And that's all we want it to be, is a Bible study, so that you can learn to study and read and enjoy the Bible on your own. And uh, from our letters and phone calls, I think we're succeeding to a certain degree. All right, we're going to pick right up where we left off in our last program, which was last taping. And so for many of you, that's a few weeks ago. But uh, we're going to drop in where we left off in Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. Is that what they got on the board? Yep. Daniel 11, verse 32. We'll just finish the, the chapter rather quickly because from here to the end of the chapter again, it's an Old Testament preview of the coming tribulation. And of course, I think if we have time, if not this afternoon, then in the next four programs, I'm going to make a point of the fact that there's probably no other subject that is so thoroughly dealt with in Scripture as those final seven years of the tribulation. And uh, a lot of it is so horrible that the scoffers, of course, just think it's a bunch of funnies. But really, it, it is a coming time, and as we see the world's whole scenario, the stage is being set for these final seven years. All right, now here we pick them up prophetically, even as we come into a prophetic picture of the Antichrist in verse 36. But let's just finish the chapter, because if I don't, you know what will happen. They write and say, well, why didn't you cover 32 to the end of the chapter? Well, I did that with Galatians, and I'll never do that again. <laughs> I just skipped the last chapter. I didn't think it was that important, and I went on into Ephesians, and I've had hundreds of letters. Why did you skip those verses? <laughs> so I don't dare. All right, so verse 32, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, in other words, smooth talk, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they that understand, verse 33, they that understand among the people shall instruct many. Well, that's always the case. You know, if you know something, you can share it with somebody. All right, and they shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword. Now, this is all typical of the tribulation that as soon as someone professes their faith, they'll be martyred. And uh, they won't last very long at all. All right, then you just go on. They shall fall by the sword, by flame, captivity, spoil many days. Now when they shall fall, verse 34, they shall be helping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries. Verse 35, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try or test them, and to purge, to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for time point. Now, that just reminds me of a verse back in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 30. Now, I was going to use it anyway a little later on in the afternoon, but it won't hurt to use it twice. You go back with me to Jeremiah chapter 30, and you'll see the same kind of a language. Jeremiah chapter 30. Verse 6, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 6. And uh, I think i got another one that I want to look at in, in Zechariah chapter 13. Now hang on just a second, and I'll check it in. Yeah. All right, just look at these two portions, and again prophesying the horrors of those final seven years, especially the second half of them, and especially for the people of Israel. All right, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 6, Ask you now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, or childbirth labor, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, or Israel, but he shall be saved out of it. Now, if you'll jump ahead to Zechariah 13, 
you have much the same kind of language, only now it's even more specific. Zechariah chapter 13, and we'll drop in at verse 8. Zechariah 13, verse 8. And it shall come to pass. Now, you all know we've been traveling for the last two weeks. We've been speaking to a lot of people. And I'm emphasizing over and over, when this book says, Thus saith the Lord, or it shall come to pass, what can we depend on? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. Even though these prophecies were written clear back four or 500 B.C., we've now come 2,000 years on this side, and it's still in the future. But we're closer now, of course, than they were then. But it is going to happen. All right, Zechariah 13, starting at verse 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, that is, the land of Israel, saith the Lord, two parts, or two-thirds, therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein, and I feel that that's the escaping remnant of Matthew 24, 15. But the third shall be left therein, and I will bring the third part through the fire, that is, the testings of those last three and a half years, and I will bring the third through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined. I will try or test them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name when it's all over. And I will hear them and I will say, It is my people. And they, Israel, this one third of surviving, or what I call the this escaping remnant, they will say, The Lord is my God. Now you see that hasn't happened for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years that God could call the Jewish people my people and they in turn would claim him as their God. All right, back to Daniel chapter 11 and uh, those were portions that I didn't intend to use. See, so I'm already five minutes behind if I was on a schedule. <laughs> but, you know, thank the Lord I'm not on a schedule. All right. So here we have it. Verse 35, And some of them of understanding shall fall to test them and to purge, to make them white, that is, through the fires of the tribulational testing, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. Now, when God sets a time schedule, is He ever a day late? Is He a minute late? And you know, the verse I love to use most of all when it comes to God's timeliness in fulfilling His prophetic plan is jump all the way up to Galatians. And I just, I just love this little portion of Scripture to show that God is so exact in His scheduling. He's not off a minute in any of the things that have unfolded for the last 6,000 years. All right, but here in Galatians chapter 4, we're talking about something totally different. We're talking about Christ's birth in Bethlehem. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. And I hope you love it as much as I do. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman. So what does that tell you? The very conception of Christ and Mary was timed in such a way that on the exact day that God had appointed from eternity past, He was born. That's how exact God is in everything He does. And so, same way back here now in Daniel, flip back with me. This tribulation thing is not going to come by accident. It's not going to be a day late or a day early. It's exactly on God's timetable. And it's all been foretold for thousands of years, and now we're looking it in the face. The whole world is getting ready for it, whether they know it or not. And we'll be looking at that more and more this afternoon. All right, now then, let's move on into verse 36, where now we jump into almost explicit language describing 
the man Antichrist, who we feel is alive. He's someplace on the world. He's in some government. And one of these days, it'll be a little more evident, although I feel we'll never know for sure who he is. We may speculate all we want. There have been books written of all the various men that they have been prognosticating as being the Antichrist. Nobody knows. Nobody will know that are believers because I'm a firm uh, believer that we will be taken out before the Antichrist makes his appearance. And I picked that up from 2 Thessalonians. All right, but now in Daniel 11, verse 36, the king, this coming world ruler, shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Now, he's going to be quite the character, believe me. And shall speak marvelous things against the God of gods, in other words, the God of creation, and he shall prosper. He's going to get away with it until the indignation or those final seven years are accomplished. Now, just for the sake of, of showing and proving again the miraculousness of Scripture, turn with me up to 2 Thessalonians, because this is the main thrust of my teaching, is I want people to see that this book isn't just thrown together by campfire stories. This is all put together by the intrinsic wisdom of the Creator God Himself. So turn with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And even though the Apostle Paul rarely speaks of prophecy, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, these are the only verses that he alludes to prophecy. And I think that's the main reason, is to show us that even this apostle is so led of the Holy Spirit that he can fit the things together coming out of the book of Daniel. All right, now remember what he just said about the Antichrist back in Daniel? He'll magnify himself. He'll speak marvelous things against the God of gods and so forth. Now look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Almost the identical description. The son of perdition, up there in verse 3, the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. See that? Ex puts himself above all that is worshipped so that he as God. Now, for those of you who are history buffs, what did almost all of the ancient emperors end up thinking of themselves? That they were God. Most of the Caesars. And you go back to Nebuchadnezzar and all the other Oriental kings, they all got to the place that they thought they were God. Now, even King Herod. But boy, he bit the dust, didn't he? As soon as King Herod accepted the worship of his subjects, almost immediately, remember, God put him down, and if I'm not mistaken, either worms chewed him up or dogs or something, but it was a horrible death. But see, they can't get away from the fact that when they get that kind of power, they get that puffed-up idea that they're above humanity. They're now gods. Well, this guy is going to do it supremely like no one has ever done it before, and he's going to show himself that he is God. All right, now let's come back to Daniel once again. And uh, we'll just move on through the chapter now. These are all just graphic descriptions of this world ruler that's probably somewhere in the world today. He doesn't know that he's the Antichrist. Only God does. But nevertheless, he's being groomed. And one day at the right time, he will come forward after the church is gone. All right, verse 37. Since he set himself up as God, naturally he will not regard the God of his fathers. Now I've got to stop right there, don't I? We normally think that someone like this would have to be a Jew because he is putting himself above the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, I'm not saying that can't be, but you see he could also be an apostate of Christianity. 
He can still be putting himself above the God that he has worshipped in the Christian faith. Or he could be an apostate of Islam. As far as that goes, he could even do that. That he puts himself above Allah or all the other things. And just remember that this guy is going to be so uniquely different and so uniquely puffed up and arrogant that he'll have no compunction about elevating himself to such a position regardless of whether he's a Jew, whether he's Christian, or whether he's Islam. Uh, I don't think it makes any difference, whatever place he comes from. And uh, I better qualify that. I still think they're going to come out of Western Europe because of Daniel chapter 9. But, you see, you've got all three of those elements in the European governments. You've certainly got enough Jewish people that are in a high place of government. You have, quote, unquote, apostate Christians, and you also have tons of Muslims in Europe today. Europe has almost turned Muslim already, so there's no problem with any one of those three backgrounds coming out of the ten nations of Western Europe. I had to clarify that. All right, now then, let's go on into verse 38. But in his estate he shall honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, precious stones, pleasant things, and so on and so forth. And uh, again, I think there's one of the scriptures that we're going to see sometime before the afternoon is over. He is going to honor a God of nature that evidently has some tremendous power. Well, what power is laying in warehouses all around the world? And that'll be triggered in the closing days of tribulation. All of our nukes. Nuclear power is something, of course, you know, that no one ever dreamed of until we got the atomic bomb back at the end of World War II. But I said it in the last taping. I'll say it again because I've had statements from scientists proving that I'm right. These hydrogen bombs that are standing in warehouses, they have never seen one openly exploded. Not like the old atom bomb that they dropped from a steel tower. They actually witnessed that. As far as I know, no one has ever witnessed an open explosion of a hydrogen bomb. And so even our scientific community really doesn't know the power that those things are going to exercise once they're released. And this guy, I think, is going to almost cherish the day when he can give the command to start. And I've said it for 30-some years that I do not believe that a hydrogen bomb will be exploded until we get to these last days of the tribulation. I just cannot see it happening for the simple reason that if anybody, even this guy down in Iran, if he would try to drop a nuke on Jerusalem, somebody would retaliate immediately. And it would just be the end of everything. Well, God's not going to let that happen. It's not going to end until He is ready to end it. So I think we can rest on that premise that these nukes will not be used until we get to that last part of these seven years. All right, so continue on. We're describing the man Antichrist as he finally makes his appearance. And uh, verse 38 again, but in his state he shall honor the God of forces. Maybe that was the word I had in mind. He will just think the world of all this nuclear power that now sits at his fingertips. A God whom his fathers knew not, he'll honor with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. Verse 39, thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase, increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land. Now, again, I may be as wrong as daylight from dark, but I think what we're dealing here are the satanic and demonic powers. He's going to draw on the demon power, and uh, Satan, of course, will be uh, indwelling him in the last half. And so this is what I have to feel we're looking at here that he's going to be toying and exercising the demonic powers. All right. Verse 40, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind. Well, you see, some feel that the king of the north and the king of the south were two different empires, but they cannot be because the Antichrist is the king of the north. And who the king of the south would be at this time, I'm in no position to guess, and I can't find anybody else that does either. So we'll just let that one slide. But now you come to the last half of the verse. 
They will come at him with chariots and horsemen and many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. Now, just the mention of ships, of course, indicates the use of naval power. And that is, of course, today like never before in history. All right, verse 41. Now it becomes obvious. And he shall enter also into the glorious land. Well, now, there's only one piece of real estate in the world that is glorious in God's eyes. And what is it? the little land of Israel. And so he's definitely going to make his appearance in Israel, and I think that he will make his headquarters in the defiled temple up there on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. All right, so he'll enter into the glorious land. Many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, Edom, Moab, and the chief of Ammon. Now, those are Arab nations, and again, to what extent he's going to leave them alone, I'm in no position to comment. Now verse 42, he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So Egypt is going to come under his wrath as well. Verse 43, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, over all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. So he's going to have total control of North Africa and they're going to be under his thumb. Now verse 44, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make away many. So these are conflicts that he's going to have to put down in order to maintain his power, but of course he's going to be successful in doing so. Now verse 45, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas, between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea, which of course is Jerusalem, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, which I feel is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, on which you have the Golden Dome, the Mosque of Omar, whatever you want to call it, and where I also feel, as I think we've mentioned before, that the seven-year peace treaty that the Antichrist will sign between Israel and the Arab world will permit Israel to build a temple of sorts up there on the Temple Mount. And I think I explained it the last time we were here, that there is that large, almost 200 feet, if not mistaken, 200 feet by 200 feet square, nothing but pavement as smooth as this floor right north of the Golden Dome and also straight east of the, or straight west of the Eastern Gate. And so that's where I personally feel that this rebuilt temple that the Jews will be permitted to build in the early days of the Tribulation will then become his capital. I think he's just going to do everything he can to be smirched the things of God. And so I may be wrong, but that's the way I'm looking at it. And so he'll make Jerusalem his capital, and uh, all the things pertaining to his power will be exercised. Now, we've got a few minutes left. Let's just go back to the book of Revelation, which, of course, is the parallel book of Daniel. And uh, they, too, fit hand in glove. And we'll come back to chapter 13 of Revelation, to pick up how the world will fall at his feet. Now, I think we're all aware that we're seeing just an example of that, even in our own country today, how we have a man who has suddenly captured the astonishment of the world. And uh, I read some time ago that they're actually raising statues of him in cities all around the world. Well, it's just an indication of how people can suddenly be attracted to one individual. Chapter 13 of Revelation, we'll use this to finish up these last three minutes. And uh, as John, now the writer of Revelation, speaking in symbolism, much as Daniel does, and as I stood upon the sand of the sea, that is the sea of humanity, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, upon his horns ten crowns, and on his heads the name of blasphemy. Now that, of course, first, I think, indicates his empire, his revived Roman Empire. And uh, it'll be, as Daniel saw it in chapter 2, it'll be likened unto a leopard, 
His feet were like a bear, and his mouth as the lion and the dragon, Satan, gave him his power. That's what I mentioned just a few moments ago. This man is going to derive his power from Satan himself. In fact, I think Satan will do like he did with Judas. I think he's going to indwell the man Antichrist, whoever he is. All right, gave him power and his throne. And then I'm going to come all the way down to verse 5, lest I run out of time. And there was given unto him this coming world ruler. There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue or to keep on going for 42 months. Now, you know, we've stressed it over the last several programs that these final seven years are always divided into two halves, three and a half years and three and a half years. 1260 days, 1260 days, 42 months and 42 months. Those are all the terms of Scripture. Well, now here we have the same thing, that after he has defiled the temple in Jerusalem, he's turned against the nation of Israel. He now has 42 months where he can draw on the satanic power. Now, I don't have time enough left here, but you see in Revelation chapter 12, we have another parallel passage where Satan is cast out of heaven at the very midpoint when this Antichrist goes in and defiles the temple on earth. Satan is getting kicked out of heaven. All right, now then it says as clearly as can be put that when he is kicked out of heaven and he's brought down to earth, he immediately hooks up with the man Antichrist. And I feel, like I said, he will indwell him. All right, now then by indwelling the man Antichrist, it will give him tremendous power. Now verse 6 of Revelation 13. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle. In other words, if it's the one that's on the Temple Mount, as I think, he's going to defile it and curse it and blaspheme it, and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Now then, verse 7, and it was given unto him. In other words, God in his sovereignty permits it, but Satan is going to empower him to do it. And it was given him to make war with the saints, that is, anyone that professes salvation, and to overcome them. He'll put them to death. And he will have power over all the kindreds and tongues and nations. Now, when the scripture brings these things down to tongues, that means that every dialect throughout China, every dialect throughout India, or any other nation you can think of, are all going to come under his total control. And so it says that those that are not in the last book of life will lose their life. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552 or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.